Hello everybody, welcome to the messy garage which is occupied by car. If you didn't know, I have a Hyundai Ioniq 5. I've had this for just over a year at this point, and I am finally doing an experiment which I have wanted to do for a long time, uh, but I didn't have the thing I needed to do it until fairly recently, and uh, it's only been relevant with the video on the main channel that I'm working on now. So for those that don't know, the eGMP platform cars, which is this, the Kia EV6, the Genesis GV60, and the upcoming Ionic 6, basically the Hyundai Kia next gen 800 volt cars. They all support a feature called vehicle to load. So this here, the J1772 port, those wires, they attach to the car's onboard charger. And then the onboard charger converts the AC voltage that comes from here to DC voltage to charge the battery pack. But Hyundai and Kia designed a system where the onboard charger can actually do that in reverse. So the onboard charger has an inverter that will take the DC power from the battery pack and actually backfeed AC power through this same port. So the way that you access that, I'm just gonna plug that back in, it's probably gonna say charging started. Or no, it is sitting where I want it to sit. So the way that you activate this is... All right, so this here, this is my uh, Tesla tap, which I've never actually needed to use, but this here is the special sauce. So this is the vehicle to load adapter. Now when I say the, this is a generic version. Hi, it's me at the end of this experiment where I know how this went. I just want to clarify, um, the adapter that I'm using only works on Hyundai, Kia, eGMP cars. There are different electric cars that have different ways to get power out of them. Um, this is not a unique feature to the car, but this adapter and the way that this specific car can offload power from itself is unique. So you can't just buy this adapter and plug it into any electric car. On every car that's not a Hyundai, Kia, eGMP car, it's just not gonna do anything. So I just wanted to give that clarification before we started. This is not some magic adapter. It is a specific thing for these cars. The uh, legit Hyundai part is kind of a lot of money and that's why I haven't done this because this is, this is a very, very basic part and for what Hyundai and Kia want for it. It does not come with this car. I believe it does come with the Kia, although it, di it may not anymore, but I think when I bought this car, this car comes with a 120 volt charge cable. The Kia comes with the adapter. Neither come with both. So this has this came with a 120 volt charge cable, which I have never used. And then I need to buy this thing. All this is, you have a regular NEMA 515 outlet on the one end and the J1772 port on the other. And on this generic version, when this little button here is pressed in, that completes a circuit across a couple of the communication pins, is my understanding, and don't quote me on this because it might not be correct, but it completes a circuit across those pins, telling the car this thing is plugged into it, that wakes up the inverter, and then it sends power out to the outlet. Now this car will do the full 15 amps. They actually quote it at 19 or 1.9 kilowatts. Uh, so I'm interested to see what voltage is running at, and that's gonna be part of the plan. So what I'm gonna be doing today is that door there leads to the kitchen. And in there I have, uh, well, I will have a cord going under that door. The cord's gonna get pinched, but oh well. And I'm going to, for 24 hours, run my fridge, my freezer, my internet modem, and my laptop. Although there's a little bit of a snag with that particular test, which I'll explain but I'm gonna run all that stuff for 24 hours to see how much of the battery it eats into. By my math, it should only take maybe 15% of the battery pack to do this. Uh, I think the car should be able to supply this power for a solid week to do all those things. But the big question mark is how efficient is the onboard inverter and how, many, uh, how much losses are we to expect? That's why I want to do this test. So part of the reason to have this adapter is that you can use this when the car is asleep. So even when the car's main systems are turned off, this will wake up the onboard charger 
and just the onboard charger will stay alive to provide this functionality. There is an outlet uh, by the back seats, but not all of the cars have that, whereas they all support the vehicle to load function. So as I was saying, by my math, I should be able to power my fridge, freezer, modem, and computer for a week, but I don't know how realistic that really is. So that is what we're gonna figure out with this here test. So I have things already pretty well set up. I do need to set up a power strip um, in the kitchen and run some new cords first. But I've actually already unplugged my fridge and freezer, so they will be unplugged for an hour and a half for two reasons. One, to give some realistic version of like what a power outage would be like, but also I want them to both run immediately so I can get a sense of how much power they actually draw. The other thing that I'm gonna do with this test is um, to simulate a power outage, I'm gonna be cooking my meals for today and tomorrow using the power from the car. So I have a toaster oven, I can use a microwave, um, I have various ways to use individual cooktop burners, and the car should be able to power all that while keeping everything else alive. I may need to unplug the kitchen fridge because if it happens to be in a defrost, that could get dicey. Um, but I've already tested this function with some high, high draw loads. It can power my microwave, but that is a thing that like it can barely do that. So if I'm gonna use the microwave, I definitely need to unplug the kitchen fridge. But yeah, I'll uh, walk you through more stuff as we get there and I'll show you the process of plugging this in. All right, so it's close enough to three o'clock that I'm gonna get this experiment rolling. Uh, first, let me open the charge door. Now on this generic adapter, because of that little nub that I showed you, I'm using a right angle appliance cord as my main lead. Um, if the cord sticks straight out, it tends to want to bend down. And if it gets just the littlest bit loose, that button doesn't get pushed in and it turns off the vehicle to load function. So that's a disadvantage of the cheap adapter. The other big disadvantage is, I believe the genuine Hyundai one is waterproof. This guy is not. So that's not a problem for me. I only intend to use this for emergencies with the car parked in the garage. But if I wanted to use this like for camping, uh, this is not a good solution. But let me plug it in. This uh, actual adapter is a little bit on the stiff side. Okay, so the car should be supplying voltage. And then on the other end of that cable, I have a kilowatt. So we're gonna use this thing. So I guess we're getting 120 volts, almost on, was 121. We're gonna use this thing to get a kilowatt hour total of everything that we're pulling out of the car. And then we can compare that to what the car says we have. So into this, I'm plugging in that power strip, which is gonna go over to the freezer and internet modem. They are now, the freezer is now in the garage and the internet modem is a Starlink modem. And because of the situation here, it was a lot easier to put the modem in the garage. So I'm gonna plug that in next. I don't know if you can hear the freezer running, but it kicked on as soon as I plugged it in. Hi, it's me again. Uh, one thing I totally forgot to mention is that if you don't know, I have a heat pump in the garage and I had the temperature set to 62 degrees, which is uh, like 17, 18 Celsius, somewhere around there. Um, and I'm bringing this up because it is early March and the temperatures outside are near freezing. Although this has been like the mildest winter we've ever had, as far as I can remember. Um, but anyway, I'm just bringing this up because if it were colder in the garage, obviously the freezer would not be working that hard. Um, but because it's only a little bit below room temperature, say I had a power outage on a hot summer day, well, in the garage it's only going to get to like 82, 85 degrees, so the freezer wouldn't work that much harder either. So um, the temperature in the garage for this test I think is very representative of a decent average and that shouldn't skew the power results much for running the freezer. Um, that is now powered. And then the last thing to do, it's really messy here, excuse me. Hold on a minute. Okay, and now the uninterruptible power supply here, which I had to buy for the dumbest reason. Uh, this is a side note, but the Starlink modem its method to do a hardware reset is if it loses power and it comes back three times in a row. 
And uh, there was a day where the power was being futzy because uh, power lines were probably touching a tree or something. And the grid leak, uh, the oil reclosers or the grid reclosers were doing that very thing with the lights. So several times the thing just went to factory settings on me and I had to reset it. So this guy is here purely for that reason. I really don't, I would just have it on a surge suppressor otherwise, but great job. Anyway, um, so that's now plugged in. So with the freezer running and the Starlink modem plugged in, let's see. The car's display will tell you how much is being pulled out. So we have 0.2 kilowatts, so about 200 watts, and we are at 80% right now. Let's see what the uh, kilowatt says we're actually pulling. If we go to watts... 177, so yeah, that's about right. This little freezer pulls something close to 100 when it first starts up, but then it calms down to about 60. And let's look at amperage too, because that's important. 1.46, cool. All right, and now this has already got power, so I'm gonna go inside and plug the other stuff in. All right, fridge over there, plugged into the power strip. There we go, I gotta put the phone down. Okay, the fridge should have power. It's probably not gonna kick on right away. But there, power. That's all I'm showing you of my fridge, okay? You don't need to judge me. Now, uh, I have a fridge thermometer, and just an interesting note, when it was off for an hour and a half, the temperature inside went from like 37 to 40. So if your fridge has uh, lost power for a couple hours, you're still within the temperature safety zone. But a little more than that, you're starting to get into the danger zone and you definitely want to get it plugged in. That was just interesting to know. So this should kick on after a short delay. And then I'm going to check to see what the kilowatt says after that happens. Come on, buddy. All that schmutz on the bottom. I've tried so hard to clean that up just doesn't really come off. This fridge is mildly annoying, but it's still refrigerating, so, you know. Though it ain't refrigerating right now. Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. You've been plugged in for almost five minutes now. Wake up. Come on. Come on, little buddy. Start your little heat pump. Do you just have a hard-coded five-minute or ten-minute? What is it? You know you're warm in there. You know you must have been off for a while. Finally. Okay. Let's see what we're reading. <clears throat> okay, so the freezer's still running. So with the fridge and freezer both running, well, that's falling, which makes sense because the compressor's just started up. But we have probably probably around 300 watts when they're both running. And then later, I've already tested the Starlink router. It uses between like 20 and 40 watts, typically 30, 40, something like that. Um, so I'm actually a little surprised it's this high with the fridge and freezer. Um, but of course, once they're down to temp, they'll just be coming on occasionally. And like I said, I wanted to leave them off for a while to get a sense of the load when they first kick on. And as far as volt amps, we're at 336, so we're kind of close to unity power factor. Yeah, 0.96. So that's not a concern with these uh, compressors. So that's good to know. So yeah. Um, and then we should get a sense of kilowatt hours. Technically, with the car at 80% charge, it will cut off at 20%, so we only have 60% of the pack available, but that's 60% of 74 kilowatt hours. So what is that? 43-ish kilowatt hours. And I predict tomorrow we're gonna be at five or six kilowatt hours out of the car, but how much comes out of the battery pack, we'll, we'll have to see. Hmm. 
Might not be might not be as rosy as I was hoping because I figured the fridge was only going to use about a hundred watts, so I thought we'd be more like more like a two hundred right now. But it is falling down, getting closer to three hundred. We'll see. But that's the whole point of this test. I want to know how how long could I realistically rely on the car to do this for me. And I just want to point out if it's not obvious to you. The car is silent. It's doing all this, not making any noise. Uh, don't have to worry about carbon monoxide poisoning and everything can stay out of the weather. So this is a really, really cool feature. I'm glad the car has it. And now that I have this, I personally have zero interest in having a generator because the car will just do that for me. The question is just, how long can uh, can I rely on it if there were an extended power outage? And quite frankly, the longest power outage that I have experienced in the last, oh, seven or eight years of my life was about eight hours. And even then that was, you know, those are quite few and far between. So not that worried realistically, but still want to know how much I can rely on this, but looks pretty good so far. All right, let's make some dinner. So here is my evolved emergency power setup. So this lighted cord here is going into the garage. You can see the cord going back that way. Car's just on the other side there. And then the power strip here has everything I might need plugged into it. Most everything isn't running. This is just a phone charger. That's the fridge, which is currently running. Uh, this goes to my Chromebook. That is something that I forgot to mention. I do not have my main laptop charger with me uh, because normally I leave my laptop docked. So I can't figure out how much power my main laptop uses. So I'm just leaving my Chromebook plugged in open all the time. It never sleeps. So the display is on right now and it will be on for the entire test. Then I just have this plug here, which is going to an induction cooktop burner, a portable burner, my phone charger, and the toaster oven. So obviously right now I could overload this power strip like crazy, but uh, we're smarter than that. Don't be afraid of power strips, just use them wisely. Uh, so I'm gonna make a combination of two things. I'm gonna make a frozen pizza in the toaster oven and some delicious frozen mixed vegetables on the stove. Now I can't make them at the same time, which is obviously a bit of a bummer. I would like to have them ready to go together, but we're pretending that the lights are out and uh, we're doing all this from the car. By the way, I haven't even talked about lights. I could easily plug a floor lamp into that power strip and keep the kitchen lit up uh, if I need to, but um, all we're doing is getting the bare necessities running right now to give us a baseline for time. So let's get cooking. Now I like to make my vegetables the old-fashioned way on the stove. I could use the microwave, however, the microwave does pretty much max out what the car can provide. Uh, so I don't want to use that unless I really have to, and I find these much better when they are boiled and strained anyway. So this induction burner here is the Tilreda thing from Ikea, and I happen to know, because I've already tested this, on setting 5, it pulls just about 1 kilowatt. So I'm not going to use this above setting 5. Uh, setting 4 uses about 800 watts, and then setting 3 and below is a pulsed uh, power. So it comes on and off like a conventional electric stove. So setting 5 is going to be the max that I use on this thing just to give me overhead for other things. If you set this up to 9, I believe it's going to pull 1800 watts, which with the fridge running, is definitely too much. And I don't really want to find out what the car does if you go over the max. I'm assuming it shuts off the vehicle to load function. Um, but again, I don't really want to find out because I am a little afraid of damaging it because, you know, it is a car. Uh, I, I imagine it's got safeties built into that, but I really don't want to tempt fate. So I'm gonna make my vegetables first. Um, I've actually never used this induction burner for doing this. I imagine it's gonna go pretty fast. And um, the other thing to mention is I got this IKEA burner because the one that I took apart had, it made just a horrible noise with this same cookware. This is much better. So that cooktop, the little burner I got, I don't know if taking it apart made it much, taking it, taking it apart made it much worse or, or what, but 
there's still some noise here, but it's not the ear piercing noise that it was with the other burner. So that's good to know. Uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, I'll put the lid on, speed this up a little bit. You don't need to watch me cook and eat this. I will say I'm going to cheat a little bit because uh, I am going to melt some butter to put over it. I will use the microwave for that. So add 30 seconds of microwave usage to uh, to this total. I could probably just put it in like a ramekin on top of the lid and it would melt that way. But this might go a lot faster than uh, I'm used to. So yeah, for now, we'll just I'm going to use the microwave. Sorry. Oh, and for your benefit, uh, this is using about 1200 watts. The other stuff on the circuit was about 200. So like I said, that burner set to five uses about exactly a kilowatt. So I'm nowhere near worried about going up too high. Let's just see, we're using 10 amps. Yeah, so we're at 75% of what the car is gonna put out. And I'm happy with that because if the fridge happens to go into defrost, it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't trip the total. I want to say the fridge is going to use about 500 watts when it's defrosting. I remember looking at the uh, label at one point, but anyway, yeah, we're at 1200 watts with that burner set to five. I think that's a reasonable place to leave it. I'm chiming in just to show the beauty of cooking with car. Yeah, yeah, Reed, it's amazing. So all this energy is coming right from my car to cook those vegetables. And yes, this did go pretty fast. We're at quite a roaring boil, much faster than I expected. So I'm gonna let this uh, cook for a little bit. Yummy. A snag, we have hit a snag. Oh no. So I uh, just finished the vegetables. I'm gonna eat them because they're hot, but uh, I turned on the toaster oven to preheat it, and apparently that, plus the fridge, plus the freezer, was enough to freak the car out, and it shut off. So I need to unplug the freezer, or the uh, the fridge, to use the toaster oven, which is fine. Um, this does pull 1500 watts, and I didn't look to see if the um, fridge might have been in a defrost, so the load of switching on the toaster oven did freak out the car. I think I probably need to unplug and replug in the vehicle to load adapter to get it to start working again. Uh, so I'm going to do that and then report back. Okay, um, doing that did the trick. The toaster oven is back on and working and I have unplugged the cord, Reed's watching it, to make sure that the fridge can't run. Uh, so biggest disappointment here is that that reset the kilowatt. So we're only three hours into this test, so it's not the biggest deal. But definitely, um, I'm not going to have the most accurate number out of the kilowatt at this point. However, I can report the car has dropped 1%. That's it. It was at 80% when we started. It now says 79, even after using that to cook the vegetables. So uh, clearly, there's a lot of runtime here. But we will account the process of preheating the toaster oven. And I am going to deliberately let it preheat. Um, I, I could put in my pizza right now and save a little bit of energy, but uh, we'll be a bit wasteful to help counteract for, uh, well, not that screw up. This guy was fine, but me turning that on and thinking that wouldn't be a problem. That was a problem. So I'm, I'm noticing right now the kilowatt says about 1600 watts with this running and the freezer running out there. So yeah, if the uh, fridge were running, that would be really close to 18, 1900 watts. So understandable that it uh, shut off and good to know that it will just do that and nothing broke Okay, I'm gonna have my vegetables now Okay, is this video weird enough yet. So uh, Pizza in toaster oven now. This is uh these pizzas take quite a while to, to make so it's gonna be like 25 minutes about so while this is cooking the refrigerator has been unplugged um, because as we experienced we've gone over the limit it's not the biggest deal, obviously, because the refrigerator can totally be unplugged for 20 or 30 minutes, but it is a little bit annoying. And uh, if I had a smaller toaster oven, perhaps I wouldn't have to do that, but then perhaps I wouldn't be able to cook a nice pizza like this. Although these are only uh, nine inch, maybe they're 10. I think they're nine inch pizzas, so probably, probably working the other one. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so this is a 1500 watt load. So 1500 watts like this or the kettle Definitely require the fridge being unplugged if I'm going to use them, but uh, this guy set to five doesn't. The coffee maker shouldn't. Uh, the toaster probably won't because that is um, 
1250, I think, but that's a little bit on the edge there. But this is why we're doing this. We're learning what the limits are. Uh, like I said, the biggest bummer for me is the kilowatt, kilowatt will have reset. So um, whatever energy the fridge is used for the first three-ish hours plus um, this is not going to be in the total. Uh, but I suppose I can just let the test run for three more hours and then cook that again if we want to know total draw. So maybe I'll do that. Uh, I'll see. I also, I'm recording this on the night that the clocks change. So I started this at three, but I need to go until four tomorrow. So I suppose I can go until seven and uh, see how that goes. Yeah. Anyway, I will have my delicious pizza in 20-ish minutes. At this point, I don't think you need to be watching this anymore. One delicious pizza later, the fridge is plugged back in. That's actually why we're running such high wattage. The freezer must not be running. And I'm going to switch this to a uh, kilowatt hour. So from the time it resets, so for making the pizza and the fridge and freezer running for uh, maybe a half hour, we used not quite half of a kilowatt hour. Uh, one kilowatt hour would be roughly 2% of the battery. So that was about 1% of the battery about to do, uh, to cook that pizza. And maybe we used another half between to 1% to make the vegetables. So let's see what the car is reporting. Well, we're still at 79%. So, um, we have only dropped 1% according to the car, uh, which is pretty amazing, quite frankly. Um, wow. So yeah, so uh, what I will probably do is later I will, or actually what, <clears throat> what time is it now? It's about seven. So at 10 o'clock, I'm gonna come out here and see what this reads, just to see what is the change with three hours of the fridge and freezer because that will be able to tell us what we lost um, when we reset this aside from the uh, the cooking of the vegetables if you get what i'm saying here so the change in this between now and three hours from now will be the same roughly as the three hours we lost so then add maybe 500 watt hours for cooking the vegetables it's not super significant um but cool Test is looking great so far. The fact that I've cooked a meal uh, and have had the fridge and freezer running for about four hours now, and we have not even registered more than 1% change in the car's battery. It's pretty wild. Okay, folks, we are coming up on 10 minutes to 10, and we are sitting at 1.28 kilowatt hours. Now, I did notice that the fridge happened to be in a defrost. It went through a defrost within the last hour. And this fridge is really obvious because it has two separate evaporators. It's kind of a weird fridge. And uh, the one up top, I have some beverage cans in front of the evaporator, and they get uh, moisture on them when it defrosts. And also, it's not running for a while, so that's another good sign. But anyway, this might be a little bit skewed because of that. Um, this only showed that it was pulling like 200-ish watts when it was defrosting. So, yeah, maybe it uses less power than I thought. But in any case, 1.28 kilowatt hours. So, yeah, I really don't know how much information we're gleaning from that after three hours because I think that's skewed very, very high. So we'll check it in the morning. And uh, as far as the battery percentage we are at, we are... Reading 76. So according to the car, we have lost four points of state of charge in about seven hours. So honestly, maybe we're losing 12% a day. So yeah, it's looking like this could probably keep you going for a week if you had the battery fully charged. Anyway, we'll see what tomorrow looks like. Good morning. It's just a little after nine, but it feels like after eight because the times, the clocks just moved forward. So I'm not a morning person anyway, but I didn't actually sleep until nine. Uh, 
Anyway, uh, good news is the uh, lights are on, so the car is still providing the power, so it did not fault out overnight. I wasn't really expecting it to, but still happy to see that. Um, let's go look at the numbers. Okay, so according to the kilowatt, we have pulled 3.08 kilowatt hours from the car. Now, this is, I've cheated. I've used the app so the car will tell me how many, uh, what, what the battery state of charge is. So I already know, unless it's very differently reporting between the app and the car. But I can tell you the battery has lost more than that would predict. So there are some significant losses from keeping the car alive or whatever systems it, it does keep alive. We are sitting at, yep, that's what it said. We're sitting at 71%. So overnight, we dropped 5%. I looked at it and it was 76. Um, but basically, if we, if we have only pulled like four kilowatt hours out of the car, um, based on everything that we've done and the, and what the kilowatt kilowatt says right now so in theory pulling four kilowatt hours should really only uh, bog down the car by like five percent well no It's too early for me to be doing this math. I'm gonna like do the real math, but yes, uh, unfortunately the car does need, it is wasting power to do this process, which is fine. Um, it's still good to know um, it's not wasting that much, but we are dropping more than I would predict based on that number. And that's the whole reason I wanted the kilowatt plugged in in the first place, but um, Let's make some coffee now. To make up for my misgivings using the microwave that's plugged into grid power, I plugged the coffee grinder in and ground it with the car. Yeah, that that's not equivalent. But anyway, I've moved my little coffee maker. It's plugged into the power strip. So, making coffee with the car. Wild stuff. You can't, this is a, uh, it's one of my various hotel coffee makers, so you can't see the coffee go into the carafe. If you can hear it. These are helpful because if I ever forget how to make coffee, I just gotta look at that. Anyway, I'm gonna make some coffee and then I'm gonna use the ye old sunbeam toaster and and uh, make some toast. And for that I will unplug the fridge again because I don't wanna trip the car off yet again. See you later. All right, I'm filming this purely because the novelty of my antique toaster plugged in to that power strip Powered by the car, I have unplugged the fridge because this is a significant load. And it works perfectly. This toaster, this is the original design, so it's from the 1950s or possibly the late 40s. I doubt it's the late 40s, but still love the idea that this ancient toaster is being powered by a car from 2022. Uh, the future is weird, but I like it mostly. There are some bad parts too. It is interesting. Um, this toaster does make ringing noises but it's never quite been like this. So 
the uh, oh, I took a oscilloscope picture of the sine wave, so that's what it looks like. It's very, very close to perfect, but the little wonkiness at the zero crossing. I wonder if that's making the toaster sound a little different. But still, it's toasting. It's doing the thing. I'm going to probably make some soup for lunch. I'm not going to bother bringing you with me for that, but I will also plug it into the car. But cooking is pretty much insignificant because while it does use a lot of power whenever you're doing the thing, it's only for a few minutes. So in the long run, the load from the fridge and freezer is more significant than anything that I've been cooking. It's not like cooking isn't anything, but you saw that doing the pizza took less than half of a kilowatt hour and now we're over three. So it's not that big of a deal, really. I'll shut up now. All right, everybody, it is now 4 p.m. the following day, and here's where we are. We are at 4.51 kilowatt hours, according to the kilowatt. Um, I don't think there's any more information to be gleaned here other than that. Um, we can tell you what the current draw is. It's 200 watts, hooray. Um, but grand total was 4.51 kilowatt hours. Now, because of the uh, issue we had where this reset, we can go ahead and add one kilowatt hour to this total. So we'll say we used five and a half, but that doesn't really matter in the end, um, as you will soon see. So where did we land on actual battery consumption? Survey says, 68 percent so we lost between 11 and 13 percent battery state of charge and the reason i'm giving that range is because of the vagaries of how uh the car reports its state of charge so 10 percent state of charge would be 7.4 kilowatt hours yet we only pulled at most five and a half kilowatt hours out of the car so Somewhere between three and four kilowatt hours was used by the car just to keep itself alive throughout this process. But we do know that over 24 hours running my fridge, freezer, uh, internet modem, and laptop, the car will lose about 12% state of charge, meaning with a full charge. Uh, indeed, the car could just about get me through a week but that would be cutting it close. I'd be more comfortable with five days. Uh, let's go inside and talk about a few more things. All right, so at the end of this experiment, let me go over the numbers in a little more detail and also give you my strategy going forward because now that I have this information, I am very confident in the ability to use the car as an emergency generator for extended periods of time. So if we assume a 12% state of charge loss, which is probably about correct, then the car lost roughly nine kilowatt hours of the battery capacity to provide five and a half kilowatt hours. So that's a bit unfortunate because that means the, the loss is a lot bigger than I would have expected. I was hoping it would be on the order of 10 or 20% loss, um, but it is significantly more than that. This is also noteworthy because if you don't have the vehicle to load adapter, but you do have the outlet in the back seat, uh, the efficiency difference might be pretty small between using the V2L adapter and just setting the car to accessory mode and using that uh, backseat outlet. I believe the outlet works in accessory mode, but I haven't confirmed that. Um, in any case, it might not even be that bad if you have to leave the car on as long as you turn climate control off and all that stuff. So there is a disappointment there, obviously, but um, considering that 24 hours of use, including cooking meals, would only eat through 12% of the battery. You know, if I have to use it for five days, that's gonna use 60% of the battery capacity and leave me with 40% remaining, which is a, enough capacity to go pretty far if for some reason I need to get out of Dodge. So I'm not concerned about that angle at all for people who might be. Uh, so now that I have this information, here's how I would approach this. Um, if, you know, we get advanced warning of inclement weather, uh, I think we all do at this point, so long as you know where to look for it. And if I know that there's going to be some dicey weather, I will have the car charged to 100%. 
Normally, I only have it charged to 80% because um, in theory, with its battery chemistry, that will make it last longer, and I don't need it to be any more charged than that. But if I know that uh, there's going to be inclement weather and a power outage might happen, I'll go out to the car and tell it, hey, I want you to charge to 100% tonight, like the night before it's going to happen. I'll plug it in and charge it up. To get from 80% to 100% on my uh, 7.2 kilowatt charger will take it about two and a half hours. So not a long time at all. Uh, and then if we happen to lose power, well, I'll set up what I just did and get my essentials running and hang out like that till the power comes back. Um, we'll also get information on restore time estimates. Uh, I can't imagine that's uncommon anymore. Um, and so long as I know the power is going to come back within the next 48 hours or so, cool. Uh, I'll just sit tight waiting for that to happen. And then when the power comes back, I'll plug the car back in. To recoup the 12% that we used in this experiment will only take the charger about uh, an hour, just over an hour and a half. It takes, at 7.2 kilowatts with this car's efficiency, um, it takes about, well, I shouldn't say the efficiency, with this car's pack size, at 7.2 kilowatts, it takes about an hour and a quarter to go up every 10%. So a zero to 100% charge takes about 12 and a half hours. Um, and every 10% takes about an hour and 15 minutes. So that's how that would go. Uh, but anyway, kind of got off on, off track a little bit. If I know the power is going to be out for 48 to even 72 hours, I'll just hang tight, um, assuming I don't have anywhere to go. But even if I had to go someplace, like I had to run to the store to get supplies or something or to help a neighbor or a friend, um, that's still possible. Just take the adapter out, go do whatever you need to do, come back and turn everything back on. You can easily leave the fridge and freezer without power for a few hours. You don't have to worry about that. So uh, there's, there's a lot of flexibility here. Now, the big caveat that I'm sure a lot of people have been asking is, what about heating your home? So the reason why I only tested my fridge, freezer, laptop, and modem is because uh, winter power outages are just not that common for us, and when they do happen, they get treated as emergencies. And the longest I have been without power in the winter that I can remember was like four hours. And uh, if I go way back, maybe there was an eight-hour outage. But up here, where we deal with extreme cold, our homes are built to withstand that, so if you lose power for even 24 hours, you're not really at risk of pipes freezing or anything like that. Um, if currently my heat source is natural gas, so if I needed to, I could jury rig a plug to my furnace and run that plug out to the car and run the furnace for a while. So that is an option for me. Uh, space heaters are also an option, but that's going to deplete the battery pretty quickly. However, not that quickly, all things considered. Um, I am embarrassed I didn't realize this. I was with texting Aging Wheels, um, telling him about this experiment. Uh, the car, when it's back feeding power, is giving you about as much as it can take in with a level one charger. So a level one charger takes the car something like 60 hours to charge from empty to full, it might even more like 70. So you can run a space heater from the car for about that many hours. Um, so obviously a space heater is going to deplete the pack pretty quickly and you can't really do anything else and it's not going to heat up your whole uh, your whole home but you could run it for 10 hours certainly or or set it quite low keep a room habitable and uh you'd still have some decent runtime so that is a possibility um but frankly if uh I have a power outage here in the winter and I know the restore time is going to be more than two days. What I would do is find out where I can go to get out of the house, and then I would shut the water off, uh, drain the pipes, and leave. Uh, so that would be my contingency plan. I wouldn't stay here if I knew the power would be out that long. But again, that virtually never happens here um, because, you know, our power grid is resilient. And I'm sorry if you live somewhere where it's not. Uh, so yes, my biggest concern with runtime, I'm not concerned with using heating appliances because, um, that's just not a thing I realistically expect to deal with. And in the meantime, so long as I have gas heat, I, I can run it from the car if I need to. 
I would just need to, um, uh, like I said, jerry rig a plug to the furnace so I can plug it in. Some people actually recommend doing that uh, and wiring an outlet next to your furnace so that way you can just unplug it from the outlet and plug it into the wall, but I, I have some reservations about doing that. So yeah, overall, I would consider this experiment a resounding success. I, as I said in the beginning, I now have absolutely no desire to buy a generator for myself. I frankly didn't because, like I said, power outages are not something I normally deal with. Um, and uh, it's just not been top of mind. But now that I have this car, which at the drop of a hat, I can just plug the adapter in and boom, I've got an outlet that I can run anything I need to. I really don't have a desire for to have a generator. So I'm very, very happy with this feature. And I think it should, um, this feature should definitely be standard on electric cars because if you have access to this big giant battery, you know, if there's a power emergency, yes, you may not be, or I should say being mobile during the emergency eats into your pack capacity, but counterpoint, um, so long as the grid is relatively up in your area, I could take my car to a DC fast charger and get the pack back up by 50% in a matter of, you know, 20 minutes come back home and get another three or four days of emergency runtime out of it. So batteries, they're really cool. Um, but that, uh, you do have to balance that, of course. Um, whereas if you had a generator, you're gonna have a fuel supply for it and it's not gonna eat into your mobility energy um, if you plan for it. There's, it's kind of, you know, there's, there's more than one way to go about this, but I do think electric cars should have this feature offered in some way, and many do. There's a notable exception. The uh, supposedly amazing electric car company that everybody touts is the best, their cars don't do this. Um, and vehicle to load, the way that Hyundai does it, is by no means the only way to do it. Ford's uh, F-150 Lightning, they offer a whole home backup solution. It's very expensive, but you can have a big old transfer switch put in and then when your truck is plugged into the house everything will work it can put out a ton of power through that system i think it's 20 kilowatts um so you could run everything i don't personally care to have that um i'm fine with just running the basics and just roughing it through roughing through it whatever but yeah i mean any ev that's got any battery pack of any decent capacity should have some way to get it out of the car for household purposes. Uh, even if it's just for emergency power, like Hyundai does it, um, it's really it's really interesting. Vehicle to grid, which is where your car might backfeed the grid. Um, I have some reservations about that. I don't know how that's really gonna work um, economics wise, because you don't wanna be wearing down your battery for that. The incentives would have to be pretty well thought out. I don't expect to see that take off in personal vehicles, quite frankly. I think commercial fleets will see that, but I don't I don't see personal vehicles getting it. But certainly vehicle to load, vehicle to home, there's a lot of really cool uh, stuff that we can do there. And I hope that this video serves as a great example. If uh, obviously the test would be a little more real if the power were actually out, but honestly, the only difference would have been I would have gotten a floor lamp set up in the kitchen and maybe run an extension cord to another lamp in the bathroom. Uh, other than that, I would have just used everything like I was, keep the, keep the freezer going, get on my laptop, and see how things go. So really, really happy. Uh, uh, I wish the car were more efficient at doing this. It's kind of a bummer that it almost took twice as much energy as it delivered out of the car. Um, and it would be interesting to know if that's a fixed variable or if, like, say I ran a window unit from the car, um, is that going to make the efficiency even worse? I don't know. Uh, I don't really want to. I mean, there's lots of things I can test, but as far as uh, meeting basic needs, it takes between 11 and 13 percent, somewhere in that range, to keep me going for 24 hours and quite honestly that's really cool that's really exciting and uh i'm i think this future might work out pretty good after all so thanks for watching this fun experiment i am going to be putting this in the notes 
notes in the script of the home electrification video because for dealing with power outages, uh, you know, a lot of people are skeptical about electric vehicles because they worry, what about if there's a power outage? Well, consider that you can also offload its power and keep your life going however you need to. So that's a pretty cool plus. So as far as dealing with power outages, an electric vehicle might actually be a really important part of that strategy. Um, and it's something to consider. If not necessarily rush out and buy one, it's something to consider. I'll shut up now. Thanks for watching.